to rejoice in the Lord always. That was certainly a song I needed to hear this morning, and I, I hope you all, as we're singing, as we're worshiping God, we're also reminding each other and reminding ourselves as we sing songs, as we pray, that we're here to rejoice in the Lord, and we're here to rejoice in the Lord always. Um, the Lord is worthy of praise, and he's worthy of being rejoiced in, no matter what happened since last Sunday. Since last Sunday, I've had a rough week. And so I'm grateful that we serve a God who's worthy of being rejoiced always, no matter what our circumstances say. So I hope you all feel welcome to rejoice. Welcome here to be with us, to worship God with us. But you're also welcome in, no matter what you're going through, to rejoice in the Lord. Welcome. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I wanted to now... Provide an opportunity for anyone who's visiting with us, who's worshiping the Lord with us in person for the first time to stand up. We won't make you do anything, but we want to be able to extend some fellowship to, to welcome you more properly. So if you are visiting for the first time, please stand up. Thank you, welcome to you all. Members, be sure to see who these folks are. Greet them. Um, as services going along, and especially afterward. I now want to direct your attention um, to our booklets, to page 12 for some announcements. I'll allow you all to read um, all of the details, but I wanted to call your attention to one of the announcements that's on the right-hand side of the page, page 13, about our Bless the Block conversations. At Anacostia River Church, um, we are aiming to be a blessing within the community that we actually worship in. And one of the things that we've been doing is having conversations related to our various mission points. One of the things that we're gonna be discussing this Thursday at seven o'clock on Facebook Live and also YouTube um, is planting gardens and eating from them. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have a panel of three different people and we're gonna talk to them about what it takes and what are the different things being done within the community to provide 
better access to healthy foods, knowing that the community that we live in, um, in many ways, is regarded as, as a food desert. And we want to think about how can we be more informed about what's going on in the efforts to improve the healthy eating habits within our community. And we want to hear from some experts. So we're going to be having that conversation on Thursday. The other thing I wanted to call your attention to, which you probably don't have with you right now, but that I have and that are um, at the entrance, are these cards. And they're welcome cards to church. And one of the things we definitely want to do at the Anacostia River Church is be welcoming to people to join us in worshiping the Lord, showing them that he's worthy of praise always. And one of the things we can do is hand them a card that gives them the details they need to get here. And hopefully it also frees us to feel more confident um, having a physical reminder that we are called to call others to worship our God. Amen. So I want you all to be aware of that. They're in the back. Feel free to take some. Don't take all of them, but do take some and do hand them out and remind people of God or tell people about God if they haven't heard his name before. At this time, we're going to take a brief moment of silence and then I'll read um, a short passage from Deuteronomy to call us um, into our continuation in worship. Let's take a moment of silence. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting in verse 4, I'm going to read for us a call to worship um, that God's people have been reciting for thousands of years, it's referred to as the Shema. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In, in many regards, the Shema is a reminder to rejoice in the Lord always. So I want to welcome you all to continue rejoicing and praising our God. I want to And the beauty is that we didn't do anything to have our salvation. But there is a gift of us seeking diligently and learning it opens up the world of scripture to learn more about this man that we love and to learn more about who God is. Um, that's how we grow up with people who are the world and so, yeah. I'm chasing after you, no matter what I have to do, because I need you. Thank you. 
Just take a moment. Let's you know, just thank the Lord for the cross, for this gift of salvation. We give it a pride, we give it a love, but let's just take a moment. Just to thank you for the Lord.
Let us pray. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever we have formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We are the same God, yesterday, today, and forever. You have been with the ones who are before us. You are with us today. And you forever will be with the ones who are coming after us. Precious Father, we thank you so much for your kindness to us, for your mercy, for your love, your great love for your church, for your people. Lord, even with all of that, we have sinned in so many ways. Even for some of us, we think we cannot point to a particular sin. We do sin because your word says that there's no one who does not sin. So, Father, we bless you because even all of these sins are no longer come against us. They have been made by Jesus Christ, who loved us so much that when it was revived, they did not say a word about it. He was led to the cross, like a man, to the abattoir, to, to the slaughter room, all because of us. So, Father, we acknowledge our sins. We acknowledge it so we would know and we believe that you forgive us. So, thank you. Gracious Father, we are here because we have gathered us here. Yeah, that was here together in your name to worship you, to praise you, and to hear your word. Open our eyes, inner eyes, eyes of understanding, to see what you're talking to us about. Open our hearts, O oh Lord, to receive your word. Open our minds. To be able to take it and understand and from there go out into the world and, and live in a manner that is worthy of your name, in a manner that is worthy of your gospel, O Lord. Gracious Father, each one of us here this morning we are put in place here for a purpose. We pray, Lord, that that purpose to be fulfilled. In the individual's life as they are plugged into your church. So that as a body of Christ, this local body, we can fulfill the mandate for us. Gracious Lord, again, you have been so kind to us. We can go on and on, but how much you have done for us, how you have taken care of us in the pandemic. Even with what we're going through right now, the so called new variant of this coronavirus that is coming up and is already attacking a lot of people. Even one of us, Christina, do it. And her family, we place them before you, Lord, that you bring healing to them, that you bring healing to the family. And many here, that we don't know what they might be going through, health-wise, emotionally, being hurt from every corner. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will be a comfort, that you will have mercy on them. For those of us who are afraid to open up Give them the confidence to open up to others. If they are confident enough, Lord, to open up to elders, let them do that because we want to be alongside them. If they can open up to somebody else so that they can receive comfort as well. Even though we know that ultimately that comfort comes from you. 
Father. It's a tough time for many people, especially for the church. Because of this, many of us are doing whatever we think is right in our own eyes. Because we are no longer listening carefully to Father. We especially place this congregation before you, that you will guide us right, and that we will follow you, and that we will listen to you, and that the politics of the day will not be our guide, but that your word will be our guide. Because in your word, we find hope, we find solace, we find comfort, we find assurance in the word, oh Lord, is truth. We don't want to be tossed to and fro by all kinds of reports because only your report is true. Precious Father, help us. Help us to be loving to one another in all genuineness. Help us to also take on your character, your character that we can take on your character of holiness, of purity, hospitality, true love. Even Father, give, give us the understanding of what love means so that we can have true understanding and we can follow you without being shaken. In any way, let not other people's behavior determine how we follow you. Father, rather, let your word be our last, our measure, our rule in following you every day. Precious yeah. Father, we remember today that America celebrates birthday. So, all the all officials in this country, from from um, local level to the highest level, federal, not that, especially among those who do not know you, that you may turn their hearts to do your will, yes. whether they know it or not, to do what you are pleased with, to care for the people they are ruling over. So for them, for themselves also, to seek justice. To be able to pull the people together and no longer separate in any way. Father, help us. Let your church be at the forefront of this mandate. Again, Father, we thank you. We ask that you build us up, raise us yourself, Father, so that we may be a people who will fear you. Because, Father, to fear you is to love you. And also to love you is to fear you. So, Father, put that in our hearts this morning. As our brother Peter comes and opens up your word to us, let our ears be up the desire to want to know you, the desire to want to seek you, the desire to want to obey you. Give to us, Father. Give to us because of your Son. And in his name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And to those of you who are visiting us, uh, I saw some folks up here and a sister over here. Uh, thank you for visiting us. Uh, my name is Peter Noble, and I'm one of the members 
one of the first members of Anacostia River Church. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'm so thankful for this church. Um, and I'm going to share a bit of a testimony in a little bit. Um, um, but today, um, I do want to wish everyone a happy Fourth of July. Uh, when I was a kid, it was the time for uh, my father setting up for the new fireworks <laughs> <laughs> and uh, barbecues and good fun and uh, remembering uh, the freedoms that we enjoy as a country. Um, though there are people that are ambivalent, as you might be well aware of, and personally be ambivalent about the Fourth of July. Um, a little over an hour um, at the Frederick Douglass House, which is here in Southeast Washington. Every year, there is an actor that um, uh, gives an oration that was given by Frederick Douglass. He was an abolitionist, um, I believe, in New Hampshire and New York. On July 5th of 1852, he gave an oration called, What is Your Fourth of July to you? Um, yeah. And, um, you know, he acknowledged uh, the greatness of our uh, founding fathers in developing our Constitution, its liberties, its freedoms, and democracy. But he really questioned it, um, uh, questioned it, and pointed out the hypocrisy of, of celebrating freedom and liberty while at the same time having people that are enslaved. Um, and so I know a lot of you guys are happy about Juneteenth, that, that memory that uh, started back in Texas. June 19th, it was maybe a year or two um, after Lincoln had signed the documents for the freedom of, of slaves. It took a couple of years for that message to get to, to Texas. And so on June 19th, and uh, forgive me, I don't remember the year off the top of my head. Someone know? 1865? Thank you, appreciate that. Um, that um, that they were free. Now, I mentioned all of that because our text today has to deal with coming out of slavery and coming into freedom, coming into the promised land. Unlike uh, the situation here in America, these folks um, did not enter the fullness of the promise because of their obedience. What we want to do today is as brothers and sisters around God's word, is consider carefully how we can enter into all the promises that God has for us. So I'm going to take a moment to pray, and after I pray, there's a few things I want to do in our time today. One is to kind of give you a, a, an overview of Deuteronomy as a book. Um, I've been given the subject of building people that fear the Lord from the book of Deuteronomy. So to give you, um, give you uh, a picture, and then to drill down a little bit more closely in uh, chapter 10, verse 12, through uh, chapter 11, verse 1. And then lastly, we're going to pick up a little bit more closely on one of the themes that comes out of that passage, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll camp out for a while on that. So let's pray. Our Father, we're just so grateful that we can come together and worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son to set us free, to set us free from the slavery of sin and death and judgment. Uh, Father, we, your people, hear your word in faith and ask that you would strengthen us in faith and in hope and in love. Uh, the secret things belong to you, but the revealed things belong to us, that we may, and our children may, obey all of your laws and commands. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, um, guys, last week, uh, Brother Michael, who is uh, considered to be a pastor, uh, what a wonderful sermon. I'm just so thankful. He preached from the Bible, the book of Leviticus. We're going to look at the book of Deuteronomy. So if you can open your Bibles. We'll turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy. We are going to move around a little bit, so it'll be a little bit easier for you that have actually have physical Bibles in your hands. Uh, so Deuteronomy um, is an interesting, wonderful book, and um, why you give you a chance to, to get to 
It's the fifth book of the Bible. Uh, it is part of what's referred to as the Pentateuch, or the Torah, one of the five books written by Moses. It's referred to as the Law of Moses, the Book of Moses. And Deuteronomy is the capstone. And uh, uh, it is a, a primarily a series of sermons given by Moses. So if you'll recall the story that God in Genesis called the man Abram to himself and said, through your seed, I will, I will bless, I will bless your seed, and, and I will bless you to have a great people. And I will give you a land and describe the land, which is, which is Israel. And he said, through your seed, I will bless all the nations of the earth. And so God promised a man who was very old, with a wife who was very old, to have children. And he promised a man who lived, uh, uh, lived, lived, which I believe is in Syria, to go, to go and start a brand new nation. And so that's, that's how this thing started. This, this story starts of God choosing a man who is a part of people that are worshiping many gods to himself, to worship him, to love him, and to know him. But God's intent is not just for him, but it is to create a people that know him and love him. It's not the desire just as individuals that we know and love and fear and reverence God. Now, we live in a culture, the United States in particular, that is very, very individualistic. You know, uh, we even have political parties that celebrate individualism right, in different kinds of ways. You know, what, on both sides of the spectrum, you've got people celebrating personal rights, whether it's rights and freedom from taxes or to live however you want to live, there's an emphasis on individualism. And if those of you guys who follow social media, you have all sorts of people promoting their lifestyles and doing their best and being the best that they possibly can be and pursuing their own happiness. And that's our, and that's our country. And so we need to hear a message from time to time that says, no, that is not the way I want God's people to live. I want God's people to live together in a way where they worship him and him alone together as a community, as a congregation. And so there is, within our American evangelical context, uh, many kinds of habits and practices that can reinforce individualism. The emphasis on quiet time, the emphasis on disciplines, and all of these can have a place in a person's life. But yet the Apostle, the Apostle Paul teaches it is when we come together, we build ourselves up when we speak the truth to one another in love. Our holiness, um, if you are by yourself, if you are not loving and connecting with other people, is severely lacking. So let's take a look at the book of Peter. So what we have here is uh, the children of Israel, the Jewish people, and they are, uh, let's actually take a look at the chapter. Starts off, these are the words Moses spoke to all Israel in the wilderness east of the Jordan. So these folks are east of the river. <laughs> Just like what he said, we're east, we're east of the Pentecostal River. So these folks are east of the river, and Moses is going to speak to them. These are not the folks, with the exception of three of them. These are not the folks that, that God delivered by his mighty hand and outstretched arm out of, uh, out of Egypt, but rather the children. And so the children of those that have been delivered are standing there. This is a new generation. They know from having heard from their parents what God's mighty power was, but they themselves, with the exception of a few, exception of Moses, Joshua, and Caleb, this is a completely new generation. And so what Moses is essentially doing is he is preparing this group of people to go into the promise. That's his purpose. He wants to prepare them because 
uh, the prior generation didn't make it because of this. So what he does is um, you can actually divide the book of Deuteronomy in a few broad sections. The first three chapters, and maybe into chapter four a little bit, really is uh, Moses rehearsing what God has done, his grace and kindness. Um, and then chapters four through 26 are a series of laws and statutes and ordinances that Moses sets out for the people to live when they inherit the land. And then lastly, there's a final section, it's his is, is the consequences, the blessings and the curses associated with obeying and disobeying God's law. And then Moses teaches them a song in chapter uh, 32, I believe. And then he has his farewell. He has his farewell. He says goodbye to him. So that sums up the, the book of Deuteronomy. So in the review, let's look at the first few chapters. He reminds them, he reminds this generation of the previous generation. And he says, if you took, look at uh, verse, uh, verse, um, verse 10, it says, the Lord has increased your numbers so that today you are numerous as stars of sea. May the Lord, the God of your ancestors, increase you to a thousand times the cross. But how can I bear the problems and the burdens of this peace wise self? Choose wise, understanding, respected means in each of tribes. And so, uh, what you answered me, what you proposed to do. So, I took leading men from your tribes, wise, and respected men. So, that, that is the first step that Moses takes. But this particular group is establishing the leaders. So, if we're going to inherit God's promises and move into God's promises, as a people to be one and love one and one another, we're going to need to have some leaders. So I'm thankful for our pastors and for our deacons, and I'm thankful for our candidate, uh, Michael, and I ask that you would pray with him uh, so that uh, together the pastors can lead us into righteousness. So if we go to verse uh, 19, the Lord God commanded us, and we set off a court. Uh, toward the hill country of the Amorites, so all, to all that vast and dreadful wilderness that people have seen. So we reached the dish for me. Then I said to you, you have reached the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God has given us. Again, Moses was reflecting in the first generation of the current generation. See, the Lord your God, verse 12, has given you the Go up, take possession of it, of it as the Lord the God of your ancestors told you. Discouraged. You came to me, said, let us send men ahead to spy out the land. Verse 23, the idea seemed good to me. So I selected 12 of them, one from each tribe. They left and went up into the hill country um, and came to the valley of Eskol, Eskol and explored it, taking with them some of the fruit of the land. They brought it down to us and reported it is a good land. Verse 26, but you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, the Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say the people are stronger and taller than you. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. Then I, that is Moses, said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of it. The Lord your God, who is going before you, will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt with your very own eyes and ways. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son. All the way he went until you reached this place. In spite of this, you did not trust in the Lord your God. Who went ahead of you on your journey in fire by night and cloud by day to search out places for you, to camp and to show you the way you should go. When the Lord heard what you said, he was angry and solemnly swore, No one from this evil generation will see the good land I swore to give to your ancestors, except Caleb, son of Jephthah. He will see it. 
And I will give him and his descendants the land he set his feet because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Because of you, the Lord became angry with me also, as Moses, and said, You shall not enter in Eden, but your assistant, Joshua, son of Nun, son of Nun, will enter. Encourage him, because he will lead Israel to you. So what we have here is God promising, fulfilling his promise to Abraham for a land, for people to go into a land. And these people had seen God deliver them from Egypt. The 10 plagues destroying the, the armies of Egypt and destroying Egypt, all of its uh, crops, all of its animals, uh, destroying them as a nation. He had seen, they had seen God bring them out. Yet, when they got the report from the 12 spies, they suddenly had a change of heart. The hearts, they said, melted within them. And it said that they did not, verse 32. And so Moses, he pleads with them. He says, but in spite of his pleading, verse 32, you do not trust in the Lord your God. So the Lord makes an oath that none of these people will enter into the promise. He doesn't kill them off, but what he does is he waits for all the fighting men of that generation to die. It takes about 38 to 40 years. Before he will take a new generation into the world. So, what he does is, even though these people have been rebellious, he doesn't throw them away. He guides them through the wilderness. He cares for them and provides for them. He provides them for man, he provides for water, he guides them by cloud, he protects them from their enemies that are around them, and he provides for them throughout four years. So while he punishes them and disciplines them, he does not reject them. So verse 32 describes, excuse me, chapter 2, if you know what I mean, describes it. So now for the sake of time, what I want to do here is just say that the Lord commands uh, many things. One is that they should not worship the Lord God. But chapter 5, Moses reiterates the Ten Commandments, or what the Jewish people refer to as the Ten Words, so that this new generation would obey the Lord. So chapter 5, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Now Moses is speaking to the people that are the second generation, and he's reminding them of God's grace. I am the Lord your God, verse 6, chapter 5, who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or the worlds below. Verse 11. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Verse 12. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord commanded. The Lord your God has commanded. Six days you shall labor and carry your work. The seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. Verse 16, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God has given you. Verse 17, you shall not murder. Verse 18, you shall not commit adultery. Verse 19, you shall not steal. Verse 20, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or land, his male or female servant, his ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. These, as you well know, are referred to as the Ten Commandments. This is the covenant that the Lord God had with the Jewish people. These Ten Commandments. And uh, through the lens of Christ, they are applicable to us to even today. What I want you to notice here in verse 6 of chapter 5 is that these commands are framed by grace. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So the Lord does give us commands, but he gives us commands as people who have been set free. Okay? 
We do not obey these commands to earn our freedom. We do not obey to gain our liberation. The Lord God has already liberated this people. He's rehearsed the, his grace to a rebellious people, and now he gives them commands. So brothers and sisters, even as Moses told these people to obey because they received grace, even now the Lord tells us to obey because we are Christians. No other gods. We live in a country where people worship many things and create their own spiritualities. But the Lord says, no other gods. He says, you shall not make any other image to worship. When we worship the Lord, we should not create images in our minds. God spoke out of the darkness. They did not see his form, but they heard his voice. No image could contain the greatness of the God who is and always has been. No images and no idols on this earth. No man, no woman, no superstar, no actor, no athlete, no, no media influencer should have more influence on you than the Lord God Almighty. Money should not be your God. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. We should reverence the name of God. And it's more, this is more than just about uh, not using the Lord's name in the family, but it's about honoring him because his name is attached to you. In all your interactions, in all of your dealings, in all of your commitments, you are doing them in the name of the Lord because the Lord's name is in you. Don't claim to be Christian. But don't make that claim to follow Christ and knowingly and persistently and willingly disobey the word of God. You would be misusing his name. Observe the Sabbath day. Now, in the New Testament, we have a very different kind of Sabbath. Here in the here in the Hebrew culture, we have a monolithic, ethnocentric. Group where all Jewish folks, for the most part, are also foreigners that have joined them. And they are going into a geopolitical area. They're all one nation. But when we come to the New Testament, what we have here is we have a group of people from many different nations and various cultures where the laws of the land don't have anything about Sabbath in terms of the Sabbath. The Christians have historically have seen the Lord Jesus rising on, on, the, on Sunday, the first day of the week, as being the beginning of a new creation. And that's more what I want to talk to you about today. <laughs> but we do have this calling as believers to gather together. We should not forsake the gathering together, as is the habit of some, but we should gather together even more often as we see the day approaching to encourage one another, and to build one another up. So brothers and sisters, let us honor this day of rest, where we rest in God's promises by coming together to hear his word and to praise his name. Verse 16 of chapter 5, honor your father and your mother. I know we've got some kids here. The Lord says honor, that is to respect your parents, as the Lord has commanded you. And he says this with a promise, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you. In the land the Lord your God has given you. So that is, a, that is a transition, really, from how we worship God to how we deal with him. Because often how we deal with our parents often reflects our attitudes towards the Lord. As the Lord God gives us parents to teach us and to guide us. The parents, this means that you should strive, if you follow Christ, to be honorable, to live in such a way that your, your children find it um, easy, or not difficult, rather, to honor. 
verse 17 of chapter 5, you shall not murder. And the Lord Jesus, he, he goes beyond and says, this goes to the heart. He says that the person not that hates and the person that curses another person is committing murder in the heart. Verse 18, you should not commit adultery. The Lord Jesus goes further with this and says, it's not just the person who commits adultery, but the person that looks on another with lust. Verse 19, you should not steal. Take things that are not yours. Not give false testimony against your neighbor. That's lying about another person. You should not covet your neighbor's wife. You should not desire, uh, you should not set your desire in your neighbor's house, land, servant, animals, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So these are the 10 words. They cover our externals, and that 10th commandment covers our heart. These are the commandments of the Lord. Lord proclaim them loud for us to be holy, and be there and not to from out of the fire, the cloud and the deep darkness. And he added nothing. Then he wrote them on two stone tablets and gave them to them. Amen. So let's turn over, if you will, to chapter 10, verse 12. So there are a number of commands in this section, as I said, uh, ch chapters 4 to 26 are a series of laws. There's a number of laws, there's so many here that, uh, that are absolutely fascinating. Deuteronomy is one of the most important books in the New Testament. If you want to know your New Testament well, you can. Uh, so um, I know last week there was an encouragement from George to read the book of Leviticus. I'm going to encourage the reading of the book of Deuteronomy. It is the most quoted book of Jesus, by Jesus. And so it is a phenomenal book. There are section, there's a section in there about one place to worship, worship gods. There's a section about bringing tithes in. And there's a section in there about a year of Jubilee where everyone's debts are you know, amazing. And uh, some of these laws that you read through the book of Deuteronomy can seem really strange. They might seem harsh, uh, but one thing to remember is you're really doing a lot of it on your own, is that this is really in a cultural context. That these laws would have stood out greatly uh, in the Near East, uh, if you go back 3,400 years ago. There was no, um, there was no rule of law for those things. The king, whatever the king said, happened. Uh, we have cultures here that are in their worship that are setting their children on fire, who are involved in all sorts of sexual immorality, who are brutal and without consequences. And in their worship of their various idols, they would cut themselves and they would have relations with temple prostitutes. So this law, which was calling a people to be holy for himself, would have stood out. So let's take a look at chapter, we're going to look at chapter 10, verse 12, 11, verse 12. And this right here is um, a moment in the giving of laws where Moses takes a pause because he wants to give a series of exhortations. He's not just, he's just not a lawgiver. He really is quite pastoral. He's a shepherd guiding his sheep. And he wants to encourage them. So what you're going to see in this section is a threefold repetition. You're going to see what the question it starts off, verse 12, chapter 10, it says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord ask of you? I'm going to repeat that again. And now, Israel, that's the people of God, what does the Lord your God ask of you? So what Moses is going to do is he's going to answer that question three times. He's going to tell them, one, what, what it is that the Lord asks them. Then two, he's going to point to a reason that they should be in awe of. That is a ground or reasoning for doing what the Lord asks. And then thirdly, he's going to give an action, an action either of God or God's people. So again, that's a threefold repetition in this section where the Lord is going to answer this question what does the Lord ask of you? How God is awesome 
And so because he's awesome, it's implied, this is why we should do what he asked. And then lastly, an action that God has done that should further encourage God's people to do what he asks of. So let's read this section. Let's read this together. I'm going to first read, first I'm going to read verses 12 through 15. This is the first section. Question that's going to be answered for this section here is verse 12, beginning of verse 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth, and everything in it, that the Lord has set his affection on you, on your ancestors, and loved them, and he chose you with your descendants above all the nations as it is today. So this first first section is answering this question. Verse the second part of chapter, verse twelve and verse thirteen are answering the questions. What does the Lord ask of His people Israel? And the first one is He gives a, a series of a series of commands or a series of, of exhortations. One is to fear the Lord. The second is to walk in. Third is to serve the Lord your God with all your own years. And fourth is to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm given. So this, I want you to notice that these four things, these four exhortations, that two of them have to do with the heart. And then two of them have to do with actually how you live your life. The first one is to Fear the Lord your God. That is to reverence him, to honor him, to show him respect, to have a recognition of him in his greatness and in his power and in his great love. That is to fear the Lord your God. You guys uh, looking at your Bibles will notice this is fear the Lord. You look at the word Lord, it's all in capital letters. See that? That's that's, that is, um, that's how our, our many English Bibles uh, translate Yahweh, which means I am that I am. That's the covenant name that God gave to his people. I am that I am. So we're supposed to fear the Lord. I am that I am. We're to reverence him and we're to walk in obedience. So we fear him, we reverence him. That is a disposition of our hearts. But then we also obey. Do you hear that? It's the heart and the life. It's the mind and the body. It's the attitude and it's the actions. We fear the Lord God and we walk in obedience. Then it says, and the last pairing is to love him to serve the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. So here we see, one is to serve the Lord. That means <laughs> you are his servant. That means we are to do the things that the Lord asked of us individually and collectively, that we are to serve the Lord. Now there are some commands that are for all of us and there's some things that might be specifically to you as individuals. Some of you guys have gifts that I don't have. In fact, most of you have gifts that I don't have. You can read in uh, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, of listings of spiritual gifts. Then you, some of you, most of you have opportunities in your families, in your households, in your neighborhoods, with your neighbors. Uh, at your places of work and in your communities, uh, to serve in unique ways. So what God is saying here is serve the Lord with all of your heart. That is to put some effort 
to serve God in his purposes. You could say seeking God's kingdom in his righteousness. And it says to love your, love your God with all your heart and with all your soul. <laughs> Again, we're getting to the heart of the matter. Is God doesn't want just us to have options without the eternal. Because that's legalism. If you go through the motions, coming to church or avoiding particular sins or doing particular righteous acts because, you know, it's all about duty or because it helps you in your social standing. Um, it's, it's a hypocrisy and worse. And it's legalism also. It could be also legalism. But it's not just enough to obey God and not have the heart. And it's not enough to have the heart and not obey God. Faith without works is dead. What good does it do, John says, if a brother or sister comes to you hungry and eating and clothing and you say, Oh, we blessed? We must love the Lord our God with, with our actions and words. So that's the ask. That is what the Lord, now Israel, what does the Lord, your God, ask of you? So we've heard. It is to fear him, to walk in obedience, to love him, and to serve him, to observe all his commands. We went through a number of those commands just a moment ago. So now what God, now what Moses does, because he's a preacher, he wants to inspire uh, his listeners to follow what he's, what he's saying. So when he says here in verse 14, he points to God's awesomeness. To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heaven, the earth, and everything that is in it. So one of the reasons that we as God's people should fear and walk in obedience and serve and love it's because God owns and has created everything. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And everything between and the seas and everything in the seas. This should cause us to have a sense of awe. When we look at creation and see God's power and see God's wisdom, we should not suppress that truth and in righteousness. But we should see that God is creator and maker of all things, and therefore rightful owner of all things. So now we move from the awesomeness of God to verse 15, where Moses, as a preacher, wants to get a little bit closer to the hearts. He wants to move them by showing them what God has done for them in particular. Verse 15, yet the Lord set his affection on your ancestors and loved them. And he chose you, their descendants, above all the nations as it is today. So we hear what we see here is not just God as creator, but God is one who loves and sets affection on and chooses. He's like a father in it. He's gracious and he's merciful. That should motivate us to respond to that love with love and reverence and obedience. Amen. So now we move to the second trial, where God tell where the Lord answers, and Moses rather answers the question, verse twelve. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? We know now that it's a fear of you. Now in verse sixteen, we see, circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. Verse seventeen gives us the awesomeness. For the Lord your God is a God of gods and the Lord of life, 
glorious. And the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and sets no point. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among them, giving them food and clothing. You are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves are foreigners in Egypt. The second trial. Circumcise your hearts. He's telling them to cut away what needs to be cut away. You know, I think of, I think of, I think of Jesus' teaching around adultery. If your hand caused you to be sent, cut it off. Circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff necked. So now he doesn't explain here what circumcise your hearts means. It's an unusual metaphor. But he says, and do not be stiff necked. So the idea that is that is communicated here is the idea is to be soft and responsive. There may be some members in our congregation that are giving themselves over to a pet sin. I'm speaking to you with the hopes that you would sin no more. Do not be stiff necked. Do not resist. Do not ignore the word of the Lord. Why? Here's the reason that the Lord gives for the awesome. For the Lord your God is God of gods. That, this is a reference to those gods people imagine that are, that, that really are not. And also could refer to also to spiritual powers and unseen supernatural forces in heavenly places. The Lord, Yahweh, I am that I am, is God of gods. He is supreme and superior over everything unseen. And he's the Lord of lords. This is a reference to all earthly people, your bosses, your government, whomever might be in authority over you. He is the Lord of us. He is the great God. He is mighty and awesome. And he shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Now, brothers and sisters, we look on the outside. You know, sometimes you might have crossed the street because you saw someone looking a particular kind of way. You might have decided someone would be your friend because they looked and acted a particular way. You might have walked past someone because they didn't fit your mold. But the Lord shows no partiality. And he accepts no bribes. There's no deal making with God. You can't get out of your sin by making some kind of deal. So this should inspire us in his greatness and his perfect, his perfection and justice. And then it gets a little bit more personal. Verse 18. This is the action that he's called, that that he, he himself does and calls us to do. Look at this, verse 18. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and give and loves the foreign residing among them, giving them food and clothing. Amen. What a great God to care for those on the margins. You might not care about the vulnerable at all times, but the Lord does. He defends the cause of the fatherless widow. He loves the father, the person that's different. And he says, verse 19, and you are to love those who are foreigners. For you yourselves are foreigners in Egypt. Not only is God merciful, but he says, be compassionate. You know what it was to be a slave or to be a foreigner. So you should be compassionate. That's the second trial. The third one, this is the preacher because he's repeating himself. Verse 20 is answering the question in verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask for? Verse 20. Fear the Lord your God and serve. We've heard that before. Verse 13. Reverence him, 
to serve him actively, and, for, and then continues, hold fast to him and take your oaths in his name. So now we, we're adding something here. <clears throat> to hold fast to him is to cling to him, is to trust in him, is to rely on him. This is the language of faith. Moses is calling them to faith. Not just fear and obedience, but to trust in the Lord God. Remember that first generation? They didn't trust the Lord their God, and they did not enter into all the promises of God had. We're called to hold fast to Him and take our oaths in His name. That means we make commitments that we need to honor those commitments because we will represent them. So that is the ask. Now, why do we, now do we hold God? Why do we hold God? The answer is the answer in verse 21. He is the one you praise. He is your God who will form for you those great and awesome wonders and sorrow in all eyes. He tells them to fear him because he performed great and mighty works. He delivered them from Egypt. He delivered them and walked through them for 40 years in the wilderness. And they saw him. Brothers and sisters, consider what the Lord has done. His great and awesome wonders that you have seen with your own eyes. Now it gets closer. A person. Verse 22. Your ancestors who went down into Egypt were 70 and old. Now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. The Lord kept his promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to an old man, Abraham, and to an old woman, Sarah. To them, he made a mighty nation. He says, I've answered my promises. I've kept my promises. And for this reason, you should fear me, love me, serve me, worship me, and hold fast to me. Chapter 11, verse 4. Here, Moses sums up what he said. He says, love the Lord your God and keep his requirements, his decrees, his laws, and his commands. He starts off with loving the Lord your God. This is the great command. Hear, O Israel. Right? The Lord Jesus, when asked, when asked what is the greatest command, is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and your strength. Love him with all that you are within. And then to keep his requirements, his decrees, his laws, his commands. So from the heart to the body, we are to love the Lord God because of his requirements. Amen. So there is a theme here that I want to develop just a little bit more for your encouragement. If you would, Take a look at verse 15 again. It says, Yet the Lord set his affection on your ancestors and love and shows you your descendants of the nations. Chapter 10, verse 15. Yet the Lord set his affection on you and your ancestors and love and shows you your descendants of all the nations. So we have the idea of choosing, we have the idea of loving. We have the, the idea of an inheritance contained, contained in this particular place. This is the language of a father to a son, a father to a child. If you would, look back with me to keep on to chapter 3. We'll look at verse 2 through 5. So remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness and spoke with you to humble you, to test you, in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you were his command. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, 
and feeding you, man, which neither you nor your ancestors have known, to teach you that man does not live on the bone, but on every word that comes from God. Your clothes do not wear out, your feet do not swell in the least four years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. That is a rich passage. What I want you to focus in here is that the Lord views this people as his son, as his child. And he disciplines the dying Turn over, if you would, with me to Deuteronomy chapter 14. I'll read the first two verses. Uh, it says, You are the children, some of your versions might, translations might say, uh, sons. You are the children, the sons of the Lord your God. Do not cut yourselves or shave the front of your heads for the day. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his children. So again, here in verse 14 is the idea of relationship that is a family relationship. The Lord is God. And if you would turn around with me to chapter 32. Chapter 32 is the song of Moses. This is the song that he taught the children of Israel. I'm just going to read up a little bit of it here. Verse 1 Listen, you heavens. And I will speak, hear you are from the words of my mouth. I let my teaching fall like rain. And my words descend like to like showers and new grass and like the grass. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of God. He is the rock, the most perfect, all his ways are just, the faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just as he. They are corrupt and not his children. To their shame, they are warped to the public generation. In this way, in this way, you repay the Lord, you foolish and unwise people. Is he not your father, your creator, who made and formed you? No. I'd like to spend a little bit more time on that, but I won't. Here, Moses is, is basically saying that you are the children of God. And then he also, in verse 5, refers to the Lord of God. Now it's true. Let's go to chapter 24. Go through those verses to establish that the Lord wants to have a relationship with us, as the Father does with children. And that one of the primary drivers for us to, to reverence Him and to Honor him and to fear him is that he is our father. I want to, I really wanted to kind of emphasize that, that he wants us to honor him. Indeed, as believers, we should pray, Our Father in heaven, how that is reverenced, honored, and respected. So as children of the living God, we should honor, fear, and hallow the name of the Lord who is our Father. So now what I want to look here is something very interesting. It's about a son who is disobedient. Verse 18, chapter 21. If someone has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father and mother, and will not listen to them when they disappoint. His father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him to the elders at the gate of his town. They shall say to the elders, by the way, this is not a new kid. We're talking about an older, an older son. This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the town are to stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among all Israel. All Israel will hear of it and be afraid. This is a very serious commandment. 
very, very serious. And the answer for the reason of why the, why the command is so serious to stone this rebellious son is, you see it in the last verse 21, it says, you must purge evil from among you. This is the idea that a rebellious child among us has an impact, can have an impact on us negatively. We cannot overlook, ignore the impact that leaven has when it's put into flour. It's going to leaven the whole lot. So Lord God tells us, as a community, to deal with sin in our midst. And sadly, we've had issues of, of discipline, church discipline in our own community. What I want you to notice here is at the end of chapter 20, it's, excuse me, verse 20, chapter 21, end of chapter 20, it says, he will not bears. he is a glutton and a drunkard. <laughs> Uh, we're going to have some gospel preaching now. <laughs> have you guys heard that expression, glutton and drunkard before? I'm just curious. Anyone heard that? Who was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard? Oh, yes. Jesus mentions this in chapter 11. He's making a comment about John the Baptist. John the Baptist has become eating and drinking and saying he's a demon. The Son of Man. He comes eating and drinking and, uh, with uh, tax collectors and sinners, and you call him uh, you call him a drunker and a drunk. So what they were in a sense was doing is they were picking up the language of rebellious son. They were referring to people of Jesus' time, calling Jesus a rebellious son that should be purged. That's what they were doing. They were referring to him as someone disobedient, as someone who, whose actions that they were to continue would have a negative impact on the But in contrast to that, the Father from Heaven says something quite different. You guys remember um, in uh, chapter 3 of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus comes to John the Baptist to be baptized. John the Baptist doesn't want to baptize him, but Jesus says, a minute for all righteousness, second righteousness. And he allows it. And the heavens open, and, a, and what appears to be a dove comes and lands upon Jesus. And the Father says, This is my son, with my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Amen. Remember that? And then again, we hear this same kind of speaking from heaven at the Mount of Trans Transfiguration found in Matthew chapter 17. The Lord Jesus goes up to this mountain some days after Peter has confessed that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the Lord. And Jesus begins to teach that the Son of Man must be rejected, that he must be beaten and killed, and on the third day he rise again. You remember that? And Peter is like, no, this, this is not going to happen. And Jesus rebukes Peter, and then some days later takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain. And Jesus is Figure, his form is transfigured. He shines as bright as the sun. And there's a cloud that envelops him. A cloud that makes you think of a cloud of glory. The Father. And the Lord says, This is my son, my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. He repeats the same thing. But then he says, Listen to him. And he's telling his disciples who have rejected the idea that the Son of Man should be killed and rejected. That's not their idea of the Messiah. But the Father says, listen to him. Jesus is the obedient Son with whom the Father is well pleased. 
He was obedient in every law. He was tempted at every point as we are tempted, but yet he did not sin. He is the righteous one. Both Peter and John referred to Jesus as the righteous one. And while Jesus was on the cross, the centurion said, surely this was a righteous man. On the cross, there was no bitterness. He said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Deuteronomy 21, verse 22. If someone guilty of capital offense is put to death and their body is exposed on a pole, you must not leave the body hanging on the floor overnight. Be sure to that same day. Because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. You must not desecrate the land the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. Do you remember that the Jewish leaders wanted Jesus after he had died to be taken down because the Sabbath was approaching? They didn't want <laughs> they didn't want their Sabbath to be desecrated. But the Lord Jesus hanging on that pole, on that cross, Paul writes, became a curse for us. He bore the penalty of our sin. The wages of sin is death. And Christ died for sins. But praise be to God, he rose up from the grave. <laughs> that all who believe in him shall have their sins wiped away. And they shall be given new life. That's good news. That is the ground to reverence God. What God would consider pouring out his wrath on his own son as a substitute for sinners, stiff-necked people like you and certainly me. Who would bear God's curse? Who would bear it in your place or my place? Who would do that? It's the Lord. Jesus, the Son of God, the obedient Son. He is Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord Jesus became the curse. He who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. ARC, we are blessed to have those who can rightly divide the word in such a way. Brother Peter, we give God praise to you, brother. Every people you have to know, many people know, many people know, pray for you. God has risen you off of your, your sick bed, brother, so that you can come and proclaim the truth of the gospel to us. As we going through the book of Deuteronomy, just thinking about Moses, who really, like Peter said, is a series of, of sermons that he's preaching to a generation that did not did not formally know God. That um, the, the older generation they knew of God's promises, but now these folks who are getting ready to enter the promised land needed to hear these promises, hear God's word again, to be rightly reminded that God is God. He is a God to be feared, and he is a God to be obeyed. And before we look at the Israelites and saying, like, why do they always need to be reminded?
reminded over and over and over again. We got to remember that the word of God is a mirror and it's really pointing back at us. So we think of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, and it talks about how these are examples for us, given as instruction for us. We got to remember that God is telling us that we also need to rightly know who God is, what he's called us to do, and why he is to be feared. So we do that in a number of ways here at Anacostia River Church. One of those ways is that we do it in the Lord's Son, which we're getting ready to do now, as well as in our church covenant. A time for us to recommit to one of them uh, what we have promised before them. So if you are a member here at Anacostia River Church, I'm going to ask that you all stand now and recite with me uh, the covenant that we have made with others. Okay. If you're looking for the church covenant, it's on page seven of our book. Join me in reading aloud. Have you been brought by God's, God's grace to repent and believe the Lord Jesus Christ? See now, now in dependence upon the Spirit, resolve to live by faith and so establish this covenant with each other. By God's, God's grace, we will submit to the authority of the Scriptures. As the final word of all matters of life and doctrine, we will work and pray for the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We will be devoted to one another in brotherly love. With humility and gentleness, we will patiently bear with each other, forgiving, encouraging, and building one another up, exercising watchfulness over each other, and admonishing one another when necessary. We will not neglect to gather together or to pray for ourselves and others. We promise, we promise to bring our children and youth to the training and instruction of the Lord and by a pure and loving example to seek the salvation of our family and friends. We will rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, helping to carry each other's burdens. We will seek by God's help to live carefully in this world, denying ungodliness and worldly passions. We will strive to live self-control, upright, godly lives in this present age. As we wait for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, we will defend and maintain the evangelical ministry in this church by supporting and upholding the preaching of the Word of God, the administration of the gospel sacraments, baptism in the Lord's Supper, and the exercise of church discipline. We will contribute cheerfully, generously, and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, and the relief of the poor. In the spread of the gospel in all nations. We will, when we move from this place as soon as possible, unite with some of the church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Thank you, brother. You all may be seated. So, what we're going to do now is partake in communion. We want to first do is first look to the cross. We think about that sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf for our sins. Right? And not only did he forgive our sins, but he also set us in a church as brothers and sisters. So we even want to look around and look at each other and see that God has called us to be a family. And although we are diverse and we are many, by taking this up, this is reminding us that ultimately we are one. Paul prayed that we would have the unity of spirit and the bond of peace. Jesus in the high priest of prayer prayed about us having that type of unity. Not that we would be uniform and all thinking, doing different things the same way, but that we would have this unity around the gospel. Then we also need to take a look within where in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul tells us that we need to examine ourselves. Examine ourselves before we partake in this supper. Uh, so what I want to do is give pause for you all to have an opportunity now to confess any sin before the Lord. We'll have our brother Michael lead us in a prayer of confession after a few moments, and then we'll continue with the Lord's Supper. Let's have a moment of silence.
Father, we come before you after hearing today from the word. Remembers God after reading our covenant. Reminded that in so many ways, God, we have not done the very things we've committed ourselves to. God, we have not always submitted to your authority in scripture as the final matter, but have often merely consulted it, viewed it as one other avenue of advice instead of your binding word, God, which leads us in the way of life and righteousness. God, we have neglected the way of peace, instead of harboring bitterness, Lord, refusing to forgive, thinking that we are justified despite being those who sinned against the righteous God and been forgiven by mercy. God, we have neglected to be committed to brotherly love. We've neglected to be committed to humbleness, committed to gentleness. God, but again, thinking that we are justified in treating others poorly. God, in being prideful and harsh, and thinking that for whatever reason, Lord, we are the arbiters of what is right and just instead of you. God, we've either neglected to meet together or have met together, but neglected to pray for them. Lord, we've come to church seeking to be served instead of to worship and glorify our Lord, thinking that we are here in order that we might be glorified. God, we have promised to raise up our children, to contribute to the raising of others' children, to seek and save the lost, whether they be family or friends or strangers. We said we would do these things, and we've neglected to do those things. We've sought the way that is most comfortable instead of the way that is most glorifying to you. God, we have chosen not to rejoice with those who rejoice. We've chosen not to weep with those who weep because it's inconvenient and difficult. God, we have also chosen not to live carefully. Instead of denying the God is the Lord we have decided that it's not that bad to participate. That the world actually does have many things that appeal to us that are greater than you. Lord, we have not defended we have not maintained a commitment to spread your word, your gospel, God, which, as Peter reminded us, is how we have been saved. God, we have been saved because of your mercy and because of the fearful obedience of other servants of you who have shared the gospel with us, and yet we refuse to do the same for others. So for all these things, we confess we confess, God, that even as we commit ourselves to these things, we still need your mercy, merely to obey the very thing that we repeat each time we take them. And Lord, we lay our sins down before you because we know you are worthy of praise and that it is right for us to lay ourselves transparently before you because if we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves and we accuse you of being a liar. Lord, I pray that we do not have to confess that but that we would instead confess we are sinners. We have sinned. Lord, we lay our sins before you because you are worthy and because we love you. In Jesus' name, who is the only man among humanity who has not sinned, his name we pray. Amen. 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 First John chapter 1, verse 9, it says that he is faithful and just and he cleanses us from all righteousness. This is our assurance of pardon. In that way. So this meal that this this meal that we're about to partake in, this is for born again believers. Um, if you are from another church and you're visiting, you believe the same gospel that we believe, the same gospel that was preached by another people today, then you are welcome to partake in this meal. But for whatever reason, if the leaders from the church have asked that you do not partake, then we ask that you would allow those elements to pass. And if you're also visiting and you're not yet a Christian, uh, then we would ask that you would stay, but that you would also not allow, uh, do not partake in uh, this community as well. Uh, so let me ask at this time, um, has everyone received communion, a communion cup, uh, who would like to partake? If not, if you could, please raise your hand. Right. Anyone else? Just hold them up high. You got three over here to the left. 
As you receive the elements, let me pray for you. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this opportunity where we can remember and proclaim your death until you come. We thank you for the bread. We thank you for the fruit of the vine, which represent, Lord, your broken body and your blood. We thank you that we are now under a new covenant, Lord God, where you have given us a new heart and put your spirit within us. So we pray, Lord, that even as we take now by faith, that you would nourish our souls. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 26. Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room. He was on Passover. And here he's having a meal with his disciples. And he says in verse 26, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread and we had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Let us take and let us eat together. Father, in the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us drink together. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We rejoice that we can partake in the Lord's Supper. Oh God, we pray that by faith, Lord, that you will continue uh, to work in us and work through us that we can love you with all our heart, all our mind, and all our strength. That we would obey you, uh, not in a legalistic way, God, but because we are recipients of your grace. So, God, we give thanks, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And lastly, in verse 30, it says, when they saw him, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So let us stand now as we close out with a song, Wounded One. So let us lift up our voices and sing up and sing out as we worship the land who is worthy. Hallelujah, 
Jesus, Grace and Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord God, the Spirit, be with you all so that you can walk in the fear of the Lord together and walk in faith and love for Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord, blessings flow. Praise Him, Praise Him, Amen. 